Okay. So, yesterday um, and also a few days ago, I got, uh, I got a question from some of you, and uh, this question was asked to me many, many times. So, I think it's worth to explain it to everybody. All airborne wind energy systems must have a cable. If there is no cable, that is not an airborne wind energy system. So if, uh, if you, while thinking to airborne wind energy systems, if you come up with some something, some concept that does not have a cable, so it's totally airborne, you have to be aware that that is not an airborne wind energy system because there is no reaction force from the ground. So if you have no reaction force from the ground, what is it going to slow down the wind? The ground must slow down the wind eventually as a mechanical balance. If you do not slow down the wind, you have no energy extraction capabilities. So you cannot generate energy unless you use other phenomena. So you, for example, use upwards thermal currents or you use dynamic soaring, dynamic soaring, whatever you can think of, but those are not airborne wind energy systems. The reaction force is important also to a kite surfer. Imagine you want to jump from the water, you can jump as long as you touch the water. As soon as you take off, you have no reaction force anymore and you will start to lose energy because you're not extracting energy from the wind anymore and you will start to float up. So, uh, another important um, definition I would like to give you in this course is the definition of altitude scalability. So, we can define we can define the altitude scal scalability as the capability of increasing the power output when increasing the flight speed for an airborne wind energy system, for a given airborne wind energy system. Let me go to the So today there are no airborne wind energy systems that are altitude scalable. And uh, according to my personal math-based opinion, only multiple drone systems rotokites and ours with header carry. Tether fairing is when you put around your round section of the tether some aerodynamic sheet to, to decrease the drag, the drag coefficient of the tether. So in my math-based opinion, only these kind of systems might achieve altitude scalability. And this is important because it may open, if, you, if someone demonstrates altitude scalability for an airborne wind energy system, it may totally um, generate a revolution in this small field. <coughs> okay, now we see a couple of words. about iterative solvers for airborne wind energy systems. I'm not sure if you remember, but uh, last, the last class and a few classes ago, I told you, we will, how did I come up with this number? How could I choose this and so that and so on? So what I want to tell you now, what I want to explain you now is a basic example of iterative solvers for airborne wind energy systems, because most of the times when you do you cannot really do round back of the envelope, back of the envelope computations in urban wind energy. You always have to consider a few basic phenomena 
And in that case, you need to solve nonlinear systems of equations, sometimes very trivial, like in the example I'm going to give you. But in order to solve them, you have to use a computer. So let's see an example. Imagine that you want to compute the power output power output of an AWS of an AWS considering a basic structural limit so considering that the tether has to work at a specific tether tension so you can write a system of five equations in five unknowns So these two, we covered them well already. The others are the basic definition of area and the, relation, the geometric relation between area and diameter and the definition of your, uh, let's say, uh, maximum allowed Tether, tether tension sigma so in uh, newtons per square meter in megapascal fifth equation I will write it here is the tether tension at the body condition What you can do to solve this simple system, you may want to try, okay, let's solve it analytically. It's not that hard. After all, it's five very simple equations. The unknown are the power output, the equivalent aerodynamic efficiency, then the diameter, then the error of the cable, and then the tether tension. So you have five unknowns, five equations. You say, okay, let's mix equation number three and four. And what you get is the diameter, which is square root of the structural safety factor eta greater than one times four times p divided by pi maximum allowed tether tension. Then you say, okay, I want to mix this equation with equation number two. And I get equivalent aerodynamic efficiency is fraction with the numerator lift coefficient, the denominator drag coefficient of the of the chi plus length of, length of the tether, perpendicular drag coefficient of the tether, square root of this factor here, which is structural <coughs> safety factor, eta st times four times tether tension. Tether tension, let's use equation number five. And so we write down that here we have one divided by two times rho times b squared times equivalent aerodynamic efficiency squared CL A divided by pi times maximum allowed sigma, everything divided by four air of the kite. So what we ended up with is an implicit definition of the equivalent pronomic efficiency. Now the, this is the only unknown in this simple example so you may try to solve this analytically mm, i think you might find a reasonably solution reasonably easy to handle solution however this is not the point of what i'm telling you because if you want to add for example the electrical losses 
along the tether for an airborne uh, flagging um, turbine. Or if you want to add somehow the, the effect of the cable weight, whatever physical effect you want to think of, you will, you will end up with a, a system of equations that cannot be solved analytically. So what you, what you want to do is you guess D, right? The diameter as D0. In this simple example, we will use, we can use, for example, this iterative strategy. Then you use equation number two and you get the equivalent aerodynamic efficiency at step zero. Then you use equation number three and you use the area at step zero. Then you use <coughs> equation number four and you get the tether tension at step zero in its first version. Then you use equation number five and you get the tether tension of step zero in its second version. What you can do is now you, you check the value of these two tether tensions. You have a numerical tolerance. You say, are they close enough? Is the difference small enough? So. Do they match? Yes. If yes, you stop and you solve equation number one. And you're done, you got your power output. If they do not match as you want, you generate uh, a diff, you take the difference between the two, T0 step. Uh, the, te the tension at step zero, version number one, minus the tension at step zero, version number two, you, you multiply them by uh, a numerical constant k, and you decide to add this to d0. So you have that d0 plus this value here that you call delta gives you D diameter step one. So now you have a new guess to start with. And you start with D1, D2, and so on, until this loop converges. So the way you arrange the equations <coughs> is not trivial. So if sometimes you get stuck, one recommendation I can give you is to arrange them by physical meaning. So if you have all the electrical equations, let's try to solve them all together. And then, because you can nest this loop, now you can have the, this system of equation is together with other equations. So you have this loop running once for every step of another loop that is outside. So with this, this is an easy way to solve uh, of nonlinear systems for elbow wind energy systems. It, it might come useful to you because sometimes it's easy to, <coughs> to get lost because you say if I, if I change this value, I lose this performance factor here, I will have this incremental effect here and there in this way, yes. Okay, how do you calculate the K value? You guess it until it works. And uh, you can check the number, the number of uh, steps of your loop, uh, the number of uh, iterations. So if it converges in a reasonably small number of iterations, you can be fairly sure that it will work if you nest it with other equations. Okay. New topic. That's for hours. I will put a question mark here and a Spanish question mark here, okay? Because uh, we'll see. Okay, uh, is, has anyone already done the BETS um, math for a conventional wind turbine? Has anyone uh, ever done? No problem, we, we go to 
all the computations together. So let's take a picture. Let's draw this picture. We have a flow. This is a kind of cylinder that becomes bigger. And this is an ideal disk. You can imagine that this is your wind turbine rotor. Wait, wait, wait. you study propeller, right? With Stefano and Andrea? No. No? You didn't? That's the fourth year, and we are making uh, Okay, I would expect they have some background on that. That's okay. Well, we start <laughs> from the very basics. What, what, so. what are the, the acronyms? Four Because I have studied actuator disk and data and momentum theory for ah, yes. propeller, but I don't know if it is the same or not. You yeah. might have gone through very similar or. It's momentum theory. It's moment, yeah, it's the application <laughs> of momentum conservation of the radio <coughs> flow. Anyway, so here we have an incoming flow velocity, we call it U infinite. Here we have an outgoing flow velocity, U, W. Here we have an area that is A, W, and here we have, we have an area that is A infinite. The area of the disk of your wind turbine rotor is area of the disk, D. And there is a wind speed here, which is U, at disk UD. So first equation we can, first of all, hypothesis. We have only one main hypothesis, it's even more than one, but this is a monodimensional <coughs> steady state flow. So what What we are assuming is that there is only a, a line, monodimensional flow of particles that goes through all these steps. So first equation we want to write is the conservation of mass. So we write that the air density times U infinite times A infinite, that is the mass flowing at the first inlet point, is equal to the mass flowing in the middle and at the end. So rho, U D A D equal to rho U W A W. I will have to delete sketch, sorry. So now we want to give the definition of A, which is called Axial flow induction part. We define A as this ratio A U infinite minus U D divided by U infinite. So it's a ratio of velocities. Velocity at the inlet point minus velocity at the disk divided by the inlet velocity. So it's how much speed you lose from the beginning to the rotor in percentage, you would say, as a one-dimensional fraction. So A, you can say that A is equal to one minus U D divided by U infinite. And then you say A minus one is equal to U minus U D divided by U infinite. And then finally you have that u d divided by u infinite is equal to one minus a. I would like you to call this last equation here equation v one. I will use letter v to that uh, in order to remember that we are talking about what pets did. So equation pets one. Keep it in mind because we will use these equations later all the equations that are numbered B something we will use them later. So now what we want to write is the momentum change. So we 
with our control volume what we have here acting on the external boundary is the atmospheric pressure so we have P A T M here, here, all around the control volume Then we define the pressure at the left of the disc P plus and the pressure at the right of the disc P minus. And we say that the momentum change is equal to U infinite minus U outlet times rho. A, B, U, D. So the difference in velocity from the inlet velocity to the output velocity multiplied by the mass flow. This is uh, referred to, because of the conservation of mass, to the actuator <coughs> disk flow. Then we also write the force balance in this control volume. We know that u infinite minus u w times rho a d u d, which is the momentum change that we just wrote, is equal to a d times p plus minus p minus. Any questions so far? And we call, sorry, we call this equation B3. And we also, you want to take note that we call the momentum change definition B2. So, let's combine then equations B3 and equations B, B1. Should be one. We have that u infinite minus u w times rho u infinite times one minus a is the expression for the um, Check this equation. Anyway, it's um, it's not it's not so important. Let's move on to let's apply the energy <coughs> let's apply the energy conservation in, in the form of the Bernoulli's equation before and after the disk hello in the control volume. So we can write two equations, one before and one after. We say that 1 divided by 2 times rho times u infinite squared plus p infinite, so dynamic and static pressure at the beginning is equal to the static and dynamic pressures at the before the rotor. And then we write the same after the rotor. So we have that dynamic and static pressure before the rotor is equal to the dynamic and static pressure at the outlet of the of the of the disc. Pay attention that the pressure at the outlet of the disc is equal to the pressure at the inlet of the disc. 
because there is atmospheric pressure. We sum these equations together, and what we get is 1 divided by 2 times rho times u infinite squared plus p infinite plus 1 divided by 2 times rho times u d squared plus p minus is equal to is equal to 1 divided by 2 times rho times u d squared plus p plus plus 1 divided by 2 times rho times uv squared plus p infinite. So we have a few terms that cancel out from this equation. We go on. And we write 1 divided by 2 times rho u infinite square plus p minus equal to p plus plus 1 divided by 2 times rho <coughs> times u v square. So finally we can write that 1 divided by 2 times rho, this difference of the square of the velocities, u infinite square minus u w square is equal to p plus minus p minus and we call this equation p5 which is p5 now what we want to use is the expression that we found during the uh, application of the momentum conservation we, and we want to combine that expression with this last expression that we found here. So we have that u infinite minus u w times rho u infinite one minus a, because we use the definition of a, is equal to one divided by two times rho times u infinite square minus u w square. So we can now see that here we have the difference between two squared numbers, two squared factors. So we want to write this in a more convenient form. So we start over, we say one uh, u infinite minus u w times rho times, uh, sorry, rho can be already canceled out the air density. So times u infinite times one minus a is equal to one divided by two <coughs> times u infinite minus u w times u infinite plus u w. All agree? We have that this first binomial here goes away with this first binomial here. And finally, we, we can write u infinite to 1 minus a is equal to 1 divided by 2 u infinite plus u w. So u infinite minus a u infinite is equal to 1 divided by 2 u infinite plus 1 divided by 2 u w. Then we have 1 divided by 2 <coughs> infinite minus u infinite a is equal to 1 divided by 2 u w. And finally, we have our new expression for u infinite 1 minus 2a, this time, equal to uw 
we call this expression, expression equation, sorry, this equation, equation B6. So let's now find the force at the disk. Let's use expressions B3 plus B1. We have that force at the disk is equal to P plus minus P minus <coughs> times Vd. Do you remember? So if we now want to use the expression that we found before, we have that force at the disk is equal to u infinite minus u outlet times air density area of the disk times u infinite one minus a. Now we want to include equation B6 that we just found. <coughs> what we get is u infinite minus u infinite times 1 minus 2a times rho area to this times u infinite times 1 minus a that is equal to the force of the disk force of the disk and that is equal to 2 a u infinite rho a d u infinite 1 minus a And so finally, we have this expression for the force of the disk. We write here square itself. Okay, let's go on. We call this expression expression B7. We use now the definition of power as the area, sorry, the force at the disk times the flow velocity at the disk. So, do you remember the first class I told you? We, when we did the computations for the fly gen airborne wind energy systems, we said that the power output was the absolute wind speed, the incoming wind speed, times the drag of the turbine. And we said that this is not right, this should not be done, because the expression you want to write is this. The force, which is the drag of the turbine, that's fine. But the velocity is not the incoming velocity, that would be u infinite, right? Velocity is the velocity of the disk, is the theoretical monodimensional velocity of the disk, which of course does not exist. So we write now equations B7, we add the definition of the uh, induction factor B1, and we have that the power output is u infinite squared times rho times air of the disk times 2a 1 minus a times u infinite times 1 minus a again. So we have that the power output is 2u infinite cube times rho times a times 1 minus a squared sorry, 1 minus a, close bracket, square, a, d. And finally, we write it again in a more elegant form. We say that the power output is 2 rho a of, of the disk, u infinite cube, a, 1 minus a square. It's exactly the same. I just changed the position of the numbers. 
weak lens expression, expression B8. So, so far we just applied the momentum conservation, the mass conservation, the power conservation to a monodimensional flow that goes through a theoretical actuator disk that is getting power out of the flow. What we want to do now is well, we want to define a way to optimize this because we want to find out what are these values, these unknown values that we have in the equations. So we define the power coefficient. Who's remembering the power coefficient of a conventional wind turbine? Uh, did anyone ever give the definition? Uh, the power output divided by 1 divided by 2 rho u infinite u. What is this? <coughs> Wind power density and the area. So what you get from what you have, that's the definition. Theoretically, this is the overall flow. But you cannot get it all. Why? Why can't you extract everything that goes through a wind turbine? Because imagine you are a particle. You are going to the rotor. You, what you can offer to the rotor is your kinetic energy, your speed. If the rotor took everything, imagine you would stop, right? Your velocity is gone, you stop. If you stop, what's happening to the particle behind you? Nothing, it doesn't move anymore, that's not a flow. And if there is no flow, there is no kinetic energy flow. And if, if there is no kinetic energy flow, there is no power. So you cannot, in any way, extract everything that goes through a monodimensional flow. So we want to maximize the power coefficient We write the derivative of CP with respect DCP with respect to A equal to zero. And ah sorry, we have to we define the power coefficient, but we didn't find I didn't write down the expression. So we have that CP is equal to two rho A D U infinite Q A. 1 minus A squared divided by the wind power density times the area of the disk. The area of the disk goes out, the, the air density goes away as well. The cube of the wind speed goes away. What you're left with is just 4, so 1 divided by 1 half, 4 times A times 1 minus A squared. Now, we have this expression of the power coefficient. We want to maximize it with respect to the induction factor A. We, we want to say what's, what is the speed the particle should lose from the beginning to the rotor in order for the power that could be extracted to be maximum. And we have this derivative, 1 minus A squared minus A 1 minus a times a equal to 0, which leads to 4, 1 minus a. We take out from this uh, expression, we uh, don't know the English, anyway, we summarize 1 minus a, and we get 1 minus a minus a divided by 4a. This is 2. So the equation we want to solve is for 1 minus a times 1 minus 3a equal to 0. So this equation is a second order algebraic equation with two solutions. First solution is a equal to 1. a equal to 1 is not a solution. It's not an optimal solution. a, the second solution, a equal to one third is your optimal solution. So if you substitute 
a in the value of your power coefficient, you get that the maximum power coefficient, you can do the math yourself, is 16 divided by 27. This is a very important number in, a wind, in classical wind engineering. You have to keep it in mind, it's almost, it's roughly 50%. In this condition, the velocity, the theoretical velocity at the disk becomes two-thirds, two-thirds u infinite. The outlet velocity at the disk becomes one-third u infinite. So if we draw our sketch again, our monodimensional flow sketch, we have u infinite, two-third u infinite, we lost one-third the optimal induction factor, and then we go out with one third u infinite as outlet velocity. So, if we plot what happens to the power output or to the power coefficient. We, as a function of the induction factor, we see that we have this kind of trend. Here you have one, that is not an optimal solution. And here you have one third. If we plot what happens to the power output again, or to the power coefficient, with respect to the ratio, u w u infinite, which is not the induction factor, so it's this ratio here, we have this kind of line. I would like you to notice that here, there is, this power is not zero, while here it is zero. Okay. Any questions about this uh, basic theory of the momentum conservation applied to natural wind turbines? If you if you do the math yourself at home, you might find it tricky because it is tricky, in my personal. Opinion. So the number sixteen divided by twenty seven is uh, 0 0.59 is the best limit. So it's the best that theoretically you can extract. So does anyone know how much of this, can anyone guess how much of this is actually taken by a modern wind turbine? One fourth maybe? One fourth? Yeah, 30%. 30%? It's remarkably high. And the modern wind turbines can get 70, 80% of the 16 divided by 27. So they get 40 to 50 percent of the incoming flow, um, kinetic energy flow. So now, what happens to airborne wind energy systems? I am the, I am the wind, I'm going to the rotor. The area of the rotor of a conventional wind turbine is constant, constantly swept by the blades. Boom, boom, boom. So you can say, especially if you add more blades, who said you need three? You can have two, one. At the conference, there was one of the main players who built the first big large scale wind turbines, a historical. Uh, hmm. uh, an important person, he's still persuaded that we should build the turbines with two blades, not three. Still, that's how history went. You can have as many as you want, right? Here, a particle, you can assume that C is a constant steady state flow, right? So you can say that the initial hypothesis of, of monodimensional steady state flow holds true, right? So if you make a sketch around your wind turbine. This is time t, a time t, and you make the same sketch, time t plus dt 
you say nothing has changed. Sorry, D plus D changes. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what happens to airborne wind energy systems. What we are doing again, what we see here, is an anus that is swept constantly, but not as fast as in a wind turbine. This time, by the time you cross this point again, before you complete one full circle, it might take you 40 seconds, one minute, it depends. But anyway, by the time you get here again, the wind flow is restored completely, as if this blade has never passed. So if you, if you sketch what happens as a side view, this is your flow. This is your ground point. Your air moving energy system is here now. Around here, you have that your blade is disturbing the flow. This is a time t. Let's do the same sketch at time t plus dt. Now, for example, you're here. This is your flow. Now, at the top of your swept area, the flow is totally restored. But here, at the bottom, you have that your wing is disturbing the flow. So, the, fine, the observation from this explanation is that you cannot apply the hypothesis of monodimensional flow to airborne wind energy systems. And this is why the BETS limit, the theory that we saw so far, does not apply to airborne wind energy systems the same way as conventional wind turbines. Because you just cannot draw the same sketch. If you, if you, do, this, if you do this sketch here, the actuator disk, you cannot say that this is, this is the area where your airborne wind energy system is working. This is not true. Any questions? You have to be aware that uh, many people will uh, ask you about the bets limit and it takes some time to some time to explain what's happening. So before going to the theory of the because the you can still apply the conservation of momentum, of course, and we will see it right now. But what changes is the final result. Before going to ours, let me write down a final observation for you that regards conventional wind turbines. The force at the disk is equal to rho u infinite square a d times 2a times 1 minus a. Sorry, force at the disk. So you have that in the optimal condition, force is rho u infinite square a d times two thirds times two thirds. <coughs> so this means that the force is one divided by two times rho times absolute wind velocity square times a divided by nine a. So Interesting question. What's the drag coefficient of a rotor of a wind turbine? Theoretically, you want it to be almost 1. H divided by 9. Okay, let's move on to the momentum conservation for uh, hours. We want to do exactly the same math that we did before. So we are not, of course, writing the equations from the beginning again. What you have to keep in mind is that uh, 
sorry, the target weight for a down flight angle is only for flight angle. What we have to keep in mind is that the rotor this time is your onboard turbine. And your onboard turbine makes a big circle. And if you see what's happening on the onboard turbine of the flygen hours, you can say this time I have a monodimensional flow. Because everything can be approximated at steady state because the circle is big. So instead of doing the same math, I would like to give you some uh, some symbols that are to match what we used so far with what we just did today for the four conventional wind turbines. So the induction factor is the same. We call it A. U infinite was called VK. UW was called well, this is not important. We never gave it a name. Let's call it V outer. UD, velocity of the disk, we call it VT. T means at the turbine. A, B, we always called it, uh, we never called it because there is no, so far we never investigated the rotor. So we will now call it AK times R, R, where AK is the area of the height and RR is a geometry ratio that we will find now. So it's the ratio between the area of the rotor, so RR is by definition area of the rotor. So, sorry, area of the rotors, all the onboard turbines that you have, divided by area of the kite. Finally, we have, let me write them up here because we have no more room. We have the force at the disc, which we, we call it right now force at the propeller, <coughs> just to avoid confusion. And we have the, the power, we will call it power extracted by the propellers. So we are assuming monodimensional flow for all rotors altogether. So I would like you to notice that here we added one more variable. So with respect to, yes? What's the, uh, what's v, <coughs> VT stands for? T turbine. Ah. Yes, forgive my bad handwriting. So what I would like you to notice now is that we <coughs> added one more variable. This is, uh, this is important to be kept in mind. So, do you remember we wrote equations uh, B6, B7, B8? Up to that point, the math is exactly the same. So, <coughs> nothing has changed. What we want to change is the math from the point where we introduced the power coefficient. We said, What's, how we define, how can we maximize, how, we can, how can we optimize this monodimensional flow in wind turbines? We said, let's define a power coefficient that we want to maximize. So we said the power coefficient is the power that we get divided by the available power at the rotor. This time, this doesn't make sense because the available power at the rotor is given from your relative air flow, but you the relative air flow is coupled with your, depends on your flight speed, which is coupled with the drag of the turbine. So do you remember lesson one for flight and airborne wind energy systems? So you have to optimize the drag of the turbine and you get that the flight speed is two thirds aerodynamic efficiency times absolute wind speed. So you cannot use that definition because that, that doesn't make sense at all. So you want to define another matrix. So this time let's call it eta propellers. And if you define it, so as a definition, triangle here, power of the propellers, so what I get from my flygen propellers, divided by F 
propellers times V K A careful here this is kite. So what you say is this is the power from Lloyd. This is your <coughs> theoretical maximum. You would like to get that. Right? But you know that since you're applying momentum conservation, you will not get that. So let's call this equation D1. D stands for, for Damon van der Linde, who first published these computations, which I found very well done. So we combine the definition D1 that we just now gave with equations V7. Which was in D1? D1 is the definition that we just gave. Uh, yeah, but it's not yeah. to compute. Ah, sorry, what we meant is power of the propeller divided by force at the propeller times D K. Pay attention, of the, pay attention to the K. So we combine this expression with equations B7 and B8. We get at the numerator 2 times rho times AK. We are using, of course, equations B7 and B8 with the new symbols. We, we just renamed everything to be consistent with what, with what we did so far. 2 times rho times AK times RR times DK cubed A1 minus A squared divided by DK squared rho AK RR 2A1 minus A times D K. So this is the force of the propeller. So everything goes away. Everything. Um, and what you're left with is Propeller is equal to one minus a. As simple as that. So this time, you remember for wind turbines you have this, right? Cp as a function of a. This is wind turbines. This time you have one minus a. You have something like this. I'm not sure where it crosses, but I think it's about <coughs> for hours. Let's write down hours. And then I think it should the point on the right it should coincide. Ah yes. Because it was Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. It should I start at, at one? Yes, and I think also it should be like this. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, the point is the maximum is here, right? So uh, the theoretical optimal induction factor, A optimal, is zero. Which means that we slow down very, very little the relative flow. How is that possible? The theoretical optimal efficiency that we just defined is achieved when we get zero power. So you want higher efficiency, this theoretical efficiency, you get zero power. This is possible because we introduced another variable at the beginning. We have the rotor area with respect to the kite area, which is the, the 
R R factor. So if you want a finite, a finite sorry, amount of power, you have to you need to have infinite size rotors. So in principle, your uh, your fly general wind energy system should have uh, on board giant on board rotors. So you want infinite size of the rotors, and these rotors get nothing from the wind, infinitesimally. So let's, let's now finally complete our discussion. And let's go back to the beginning. We said the power output <coughs> for flight systems by Lloyd was drag of the turbine times relative <coughs> um, incoming magnitude of the velocity. This can be achieved, yes at the condition that the rotor is infinitely large. So we might expect that we get a percentage of this, right, in, in a real world scenario. So um, I think, what's the time? Yes, it's almost time. So um, what we can what we can write down now is the drag coefficient of the propeller. Let's call it type based because it is defined with respect to the kite area. And we define it as the force of the propeller divided by one divided by two rho dk squared. A K. We insert the definition, sorry, the expression of the force that we found from the application of the momentum theory. So two times, sorry, two times rho times B K <coughs> square A K R R A one minus A divided by one divided by two the rho d k square a k. So everything, not everything, something goes away. And we have that the drag coefficient of the propeller is again kind of based it's always kite based anyway. Yeah? I'm just writing it down to be clearer. Is four times R R times one minus A times A. So do you remember how much was the drug? coefficient of the turbine in the Lloyd's optimization. Can you go? Mm -hmm. It was half of the drag coefficient of the kite. Right? So <coughs> we would call it C D wing. It's the same of C D kite. So we can combine these two equations and what we get is for R R A one minus A is equal to one divided by two C D win and your ratio between the rotors area and the kite area is the drag of the wing coefficient 
divided by 8a1 minus a. We already know that we would like to have 0a, which of course makes no sense. So we, I would like to give you an example. And uh, if you're curious, you will find all the information in chapter 28 of their Roman Danger book. 2013. The drag coefficient of the wind is, for example, 0.1. A, assume you want to, you can achieve 0.03. You can rotors area divided by kite area is zero point forty two. So in a real world example you might end up with these kind of numbers. I'm giving this to you as a, just as an example as a reference. <coughs> Let's have a five minutes break, and then yeah. uh, Gonzalo will explain you the uh, scenario. <coughs> Any questions, by the way? You're tired. It's Friday. Yeah, fiesta, fiesta. And there are different levels of complexity. And of course, each level of complexity of the simulator is convenient for a different phase of design. And for instance, I, I will present first a table with the different options that you can take or you can follow to develop a simulator. Okay, and let us discuss what are the advantages and disadvantages of each type of simulator. And this is important because one of the most important decisions that an engineer has to take in his life is, or when he or she has to face a given problem, is to decide what is the level of complexity that you have taken. For your uh, TFM and TFJ, this is normally one of the things that are more difficult for the students. Because sometimes you arrive to our office and you want to solve the work. You want to make a simulator and want to solve everything. And that's impossible. But on the other hand, we shouldn't do things that are trivial. Okay? The, the, the model shouldn't be so simple that you can't extract useful information from it. So imagine that we want to make the most complex simulator. Okay, let us start, we want to be ambitious. But very often when you are ambitious, you are so stupid because you, you will get nothing from that. But then let's start trying to be very ambitious. So at the end, our system, this is our axis it has a cable or a set of cables and some kind of drone or kite here. So <clears throat> the most difficult thing that you can do with the cable <coughs> is to model the cable as an elastic continuous uh, system. Okay? So you may start including elasticity in the cable. It means that the cable, you can fold it, but you can also uh, chain its length okay, by applying a force that is elastic. In this case, the equation you have to solve for the cable it is a partial differential equation because it is a continuous medium as a fluid. 
So the state vector of the cable is given by R, that is the position vector of any point of the cable. So the, the cable is, is continuous. So any point, for instance, this point, the state of this point is given by the position vector of this point. And this position vector depends on S and T. T is time, because the guy the, the definitely is moving. So the position of the point is moving. It depends on time and also on S. S is the arc length, the longitude arc, along the cable. In such a way that if, if this is your cable, here S is equal to zero, and here S is equal to L. You see, so it is a continuous medium, so uh, S take any value within this range. And you have a partial differential equation for the cable. This uh, the linear density, you have here the second partial derivative of the position vector of the cable with respect to time. Call it equal to we have here well, I will write it this way. Plus other forces like, for instance, gravity, etc. Okay, so here I'm saying that the mass of the cable, this is a density, okay, this is a mass per unit length multiplied by the acceleration of the cable, it is equal to the forces. So what are the forces that appear in the cable? This one, that this is the tether tension, this is the elongation, okay, and this is the tangent vector along the cable. And let's call it time. So at each point of the cable, you have a tangent vector. Here, here, etc. And you also need to add here other forces, like for instance, the weight of the cable, the aerodynamic drag of the cable, etc. Okay, but you have a PD, a partial differential equation. This is the key. Now you can cover this equation with and an elastic model for the kite or the drone or you can couple it with a rigid body model for the kite and the drone Why are they coupled? Because the boundary for, for this PD, you have to give initial conditions and boundary conditions. The boundary conditions here, they are very easy. This point is fixed, but the boundary condition of this point, how does this point move? It depends on the dynamics of, of the kite. And on the other hand, the dynamic of the kite depends on the tension force that you have at the cable. So this partial differential equation is coupled with the dynamics of the kite and the that you have to cover. Okay? And you can use two different models for the kite. You can uh, think that the kite is elastic, as it is in the real world, but if you model it, if you model the kite as an elastic object, then you have to solve another, another PD for the kite. Another partial differential equation. Because it is flexible. If you assume that the kite is rigid, then the equation for the kite are the sum of the forces are equal to MA and the sum of the torque, our center of mass is equal to the derivative of the angular momentum of the kite with respect to time. 
and these are ordinary differential equations, not partial differential equations. This, set, this is a set of six ordinary differential equations, second order. Much simple that if you make this. Questions? You have a global picture? Okay, now. <clears throat> this model, a simulator of an elastic tether coupled with an elastic kite, to the best of my knowledge, nobody did. Yeah. Nobody did. And in my opinion, it has no sense to develop such a model. Because you may you you shouldn't think on a simulator like a like a box where you put everything and then you move the box and you get results. Okay? This is not a simulator. You shouldn't work like that. You should write the simulator when you know what are the results that you want to obtain from the simulator. So if you don't control the complexity of your simulator, you will not be able to do real research and real engineering in the simulator. <clears throat> it is true that people have developed elastic model for the cable and they have and they are doing elasticity research on kites, but under control conditions. For instance, they have developed the equation of, uh, of the kite, but they keep it fixed. And for instance, they study what's happening with the shape of the kite and the dynamic forces when they change the inflow, the incoming flow. Things like that. But they don't copy everything together because this is a mess. And at the end, you are not able to do anything. And of course, it's super expensive okay, for computational performance. <clears throat> there are, uh, well, here there is something even more simple. You can also consider the kite as a point. Or the drum as a, as a point. And in this case, you only need to couple this equation with the sum of the forces equal to MA. Some people develop such a simulator, elastic tether with a point-like model for the kite. And you can do research with that. But it is delicate because the dynamic forces on the kite depend on the attitude of the kite. It depends on the angle of attack and the side of the panel. So if your model does not capture the attitude dynamic of the kite, you don't have an accurate um, modelization of the dynamic forces that are key <coughs> for this type of systems. So what they do is sometimes they create some kind of empirical laws for the attitude of the kite. Or they assume that the kite is following certain attitudes. But of course, it is not so consistent. Questions? Antonello, do you know about someone who developed a model of an elastic tether with a rigid body model for the kite? I think Woodbock is the best. Maybe in 2000, back in 2010. Woodbock. Woodbockers? I think. Yeah. Maybe there, there is something, but I'm not sure they, they have been through that circle system. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. <clears throat> there are no questions, but this is doable. I mean, elastic, uh, well, actually, I have, I have done that. Okay? One of my simulators is an elastic tether with a, a rigid body model for the kite. But this is not convenient, in my opinion. Why? Because when you have a tether, um, um, you have waves. Okay? It's a continuous medium, and of course, you have waves. When I move one of the points, it takes time to arrive such a wave to a different point. Okay? There is a finite uh, velocity for the waves inside such a medium. In the same way that if you have a fluid, you have a tank of water, and you drop an object, this great wave, and the vector vessel introduced takes time to arrive to other point. The same thing happened for a tether, that is a continuous medium. 
<coughs> an, an important point is what is the velocity of such a waves? Because, of course, you have, at the end you have to solve all this stuff with the computer. And you need a, a numerical integrator. And in the numerical integrator, you have a time step. I, I, I hope you know what I'm talking about. Okay, the time step of the integrator. And the resolution of uh, your simulation should capture the fastest time scale. For instance, imagine that our variable is doing this. Okay? So our integrator, imagine we have this time step. This is time, and this is one of the variables. In principle, I would like to have points distributed in this way, right? In order to capture the signal. If I take the time state as large as this, and I have a point here and a point there, I don't know what's happening between, and it is important. And it can have issues like numerical instabilities, I don't know what's happening. It's so the time state should capture the dynamics. So, if you are working with a medium like a test, and one of the velocities of the waves, because you can have different types of waves, is very large, then you will need a very small time step to simulate the dynamics. And at the end, you will not be able to simulate, for, for instance, one of the factors that Andrelo showed you, you want to simulate the cycle in a flight generation system. If you need to, and the cycle is done in one minute, but the velocity of the waves of the tether is huge and your time step is one nanosecond in the simulator, you will need one year to compute one of the vehicles. I don't know. You see? So you can you can run the simulator, but at the end you will not be able to do anything with it. Because it will be so slow that it is not practical. Because by the way, what you want to do with the simulator normally, it is a parametric analysis. You want to see what happens if I double the size of the kite. You want to know what happens if I multiply a factor three the span of the kite, this type of things. Okay, parametric analysis. So the simulator should be fast. And what's happening with the tether? You have two types of, two type of waves. If you take a string, you have transversal uh, oscillations. So you may think about a guitar. So you take a string, and then you uh, put the cable down, and the string oscillates in this direction. These are slow oscillations. And the same thing happens for the kite. I mean, when the cable is moving in this direction, these oscillations are slow, in the sense that the time scale of such oscillations are of the same order of the time scale of the motion of the kite. So these oscillations are OK. And we should capture it. If we want to, if we want to capture uh, tether sewing, etc. But what's <coughs> happening with the longitudinal oscillations. So the transport of the signal along the cable. Imagine you take a piece of metal, so now this piece of metal is our cable. And imagine I take a hammer and I and I and I pull this point here. <coughs> How much time do you think that it takes the signal to arrive to this point? Nothing. Nothing. Because the higher the steepness of your material, the largest, the larger the, the velocity of the longitudinal waves. And it turns out that for kites, the steepness of the tether is very large. And the longitudinal and the velocity of the longitudinal oscillation is very large. So, if we take a model with an elastic cable, your system will be stiff. Did you study numerical method in the career? Did someone mention to you a stiff equation? A stiff, you have a stiff system when you have two time scales, the fast and the slow. 
So for instance, in the case of a iron energy system with the elastic tether, if you look at the tether, you have this. This is the low scale, but this is the fast scale. And when you integrate, you need to capture the fast scale. So this is fading in it. So we want a model that is able to capture this while removing this fast oscillation, but still keeping the physics. Okay? So in my opinion, elastic, including elasticity, it is not a good approach for this type of system. By the way, uh, the elasticity for a dynamic cable, the, the thickness is really high. It's half of that of steel. It's 100 and something um, gigapascal. So Steel means the Janus model. Maybe you are familiar, familiar with the Janus model. So the, the waves, they depend on that parameter. So what can we do? We have to construct a model that captures the transversal oscillations of the cable, but removes the longitudinal one. And what we can do is uh, substitute the cable by a set of rigid parts, infinitely rigid. Okay? So if you, t if you use many parts, you are able to capture flexibility because the bars are articulated. But you do not capture elasticity, because if you put all the bars, if you make a force here, since the bars are inelastic, you will not be able to chain the, le the total length of the, of the, of the table. Okay? In other words, for this type of system, any <coughs> perturbation here, it, it is automatically transmitted to the last point, because the, <coughs> the propagation velocity of the longitudinal waves is equal to infinity. So we are removing the fast oscillations from the front scratch. So the second approach is we use a flexible but inelastic But then, if you do this, you have a problem. And in order to illustrate this problem, we are going to do an example. Questions? No? Let us do an example. Imagine we have a pendulum. X <coughs> set. This is my pendulum, of here mass. And this is my cable. It has length equal to L, and gravity points in this direction. Let us write the equation of motion of this system. <coughs> the vector, the position vector, is equal to x i plus z k, right? The velocity is x dot plus z dot k. And the acceleration is equal to x dot dot i plus z dot dot k. Questions? So this is the, this is the kinematic. This is the kinematic. Now we have to compute the forces. <coughs> what are the forces we have at the ball? Mass m. The weight? Anything else? Tension. In which direction? The direction of the cable. Tension. Right? So the weight is equal to Nj k. And the tension is equal to <coughs> right? Where U R is this vector. 
two questions. But I have to predict this vector in this base in order to write the equation of motion down. Let us do it. We have who is UR? UR is this vector here. Right? So I can write it as this length, right? So let us introduce an auxiliary angle, theta. So UR is sine of theta i plus <coughs> cosine of theta k. And now I also realize that sine of theta is equal to x divided by L and cosine of theta is z divided by L. Right? So we have minus t divided by L xi plus z k. And the equation of motion are uh, m x dot dot equal to minus t divided by l x and n set dot dot equal to minus t divided by l set plus n j. Let me check. <coughs> yeah, perfect. Right? So this is my set of formula differential equations. How many unknowns do we have here? What are the unknowns? Three. How many? Uh, can you? They are x, z, and x t. of t, z of t, and t of t. And t of t. But we have two equations. What's happening here? You have to I have to <coughs> constraint. I have to constraint. I have to add x squared plus z squared equal to l squared. Did you see, when we have an inelastic bar, we have a constraint. And what we find is, if we apply classical <coughs> formulation, we find a system that is a mix of ordinary differential equations with nonlinear algebraic equations. And you have to solve everything so consistent. <coughs> What's happening? If you want to use, for instance, MATLAB, you want to use all the 45, all the 45 can deal with this type of equations. But how can you couple this nonlinear algebra constraint to MATLAB solvers? This is more complex. It means that at each time step, you need to solve a nonlinear algebraic equation. Or in case you have many bars, you will need to solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equation with a Newton method. So at each time step, you need to implement a Newton new method. And this is a pain in the neck. This is a pain in the neck. So, <clears throat> what is the solution for that? Who knows that? How can I decouple? The problem here is that the tension force it is an unknown and it is coupled with the dynamics. How can I get rid of the tension force? What does it mean? To express the tension in terms of x and z. To express the tension? Tension in terms of x and z position or its derivatives. No, but they cannot do that. I mean, the tension is an unknown. It has to be solved as part of the solution. I don't know the tension in advance. <coughs> it depends on the dynamics. So the, the trick is to project f here, I project f equal to ma along these two directions, x and z, right? What about if I project this equation along ur and u theta? Since t 
has no component along u theta, I will find an equation without such a, such a value. You see? Or I can also use a different parametrization. And solve the pendulum as probably you have done in classical mechanics. Okay, now I write R equal to L U R. B with U R is this vector. Okay, this is this is U R. Now I can, have, I can also define U theta. So this is vector. And this is theta. Take the derivative and define L theta dot U theta. You can check at home that the derivative of U R with respect to time, this is theta dot U theta. And the derivative of U theta with respect to time, this is minus theta dot U R. Something you learn in classical mechanics, you can do it again by yourself. So, the acceleration is L theta dot dot u theta minus theta dot square u r. Correct? This is the kinematic. Let us now do the forces. We have the tension <laughs> is equal to minus t of t u r and the weight. I have to find k in the base u r u theta. You can do it at home. It is mv cosine of theta u r minus sine of theta u theta. This is k. And now we can write the equation of motion. And you find T plus NJ cosine of theta equal to minus L theta root square N and minus NJ sine of theta equal to N L theta root dot. And we have two equations with two unknowns. So my unknowns are t of t and theta of t. But look, since we project this equation along u r and u theta, the projection of this along u theta, that is this one, it does not involve full tension. So this is an equation that gives to me theta of t. This is something I can solve with my lab. And once I find theta of t, I can insert this here and find t. It is the coplet. <clears throat> so we arrive at the following conclusion. We can use models based on Inelastic, inelastic bars, but we have to be smart when we project the equation of motion. Because we should project the equation of motion in such a way that the constraint forces do not appear in the equation of motion. The question is, how can we do this trick? How can we find the right projection of the equation of motion when, for a pendulum, it is trivial? But what's happening when I have many bars with the type, etc., etc. What is the tool we can use to find the right component of this equation? And when I say right component, I mean the component without the constraint forces. This is can be done systematically with the method that is called Lagrangian mechanics. Lagrangian mechanics. It is something totally equivalent to F equal to MA. But we write the equation of motion in a different way. A 
and it is very simple. Actually, it is simpler than what you learn in classical mechanics. You will see, and you will wonder why we didn't teach you this first. Earlier. Step number one. Write a function that is called the Lagrangian function. And by definition, it is equal to the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. <coughs> Write this function. And second, um, the equation of motion are given by the following equation. This is for conservative systems. So this is valid when all the forces <coughs> depend on potential, or they derive from potential. Let us do the example of the pendulum. And you will see how simple it is. Step number one, we write the Lagrangian of the pendulum. The kinetic energy is this, right? This is the kinetic energy. So, for the pendulum, we find the, the modulus here, V squared is L squared, theta dot squared. Questions? U. How much is the potential energy? It is equal to minus N J L cosine of theta. Because L cosine of theta, I erase the x and this is theta so the cosine is l cosine is this length so this is the potential okay so my lagrangian function is l i found the lagrangian and here q means you are degrees of freedom. My degrees of freedom here are is theta. Okay? So the only thing I have to do is to apply this formula to this function. Let us do it. <coughs> the partial of L with respect to theta dot, this is n L squared theta. So the derivative with respect to time on the partial of L with respect to theta dot, this is N L squared theta dot dot. And the partial of L with respect to theta, it is minus N J L sin of theta. We put everything together. And we find n l squared theta dot dot plus n j l sin of theta equal to zero. Is this is a question. And we are done. Okay, we arrive at the same result that we found here. It is the same equation that here. Okay, so there is a systematic procedure for writing the equation of motion of the mechanical system and removing the constant forces. And this is called Lagrangian mechanics. And you can see that it is easier than classical mechanics formulation because I didn't work with vectors. Everything is, uh, when I did all these steps, I didn't use vectors. I just use um, functions. Okay, so <coughs> UC3 and simulator are all based on Lagrangian mechanics because we discretize the tester using rigid parts. And we did that to avoid the fast scale of oscillations. Let us now play five minutes because it's almost time, right? So I will show you a video in the simulator.
going to come here. <clears throat> so our simulator it is a box that needs initial conditions, the control load, in the pendulum, for instance, the length of the pendulum, it could depend on time. So someone could drill in, drill out the pendulum. And we can follow exactly the same procedure and capture such effect in the equation. So our simulator needs the initial conditions and the control load. And here I will show you an example of a kite where the, the bridle, uh, the length of the bridle is controlled following certain law that make the kite to follow a figure of eight. But as Antonello told you, this is uh, what we want to uh, do when we want to generate energy in a ground gen system. Because during the figure of eight, the traction of the tether is very high. I hope it will work. Ah, but then, you have the movie, you have the movie. And the other one, yes. I don't know if I have the movie active or not. No. <laughs> This is a simulation with one bar. This is the center of mass of the bar, and here you have the kite. Here you have the bridle. So we are modifying the relative length of this cable. We have to insert such a control node. And this is a rigid kite, right? And this is a rigid kite. So this type of simulator, they are important for different reasons. First. Uh, you want to know how are the performance of the system affected by the, the, by the design, the length of the tether, the diameter of the tether, the size of the kite, etc. But it is also important because uh, I think Antonio made emphasis during the call that at the end we want an autonomous system, something robust and autonomous. So we need robust control here, close loop control. And for this type of control, we need to estimate the dynamics. We need a dynamical model for that. So the simulator, the good point is that it gives all the things you wish. For instance, here you can see uh, this is information related with the bridle. How do we deflect the length of the bridle? But instead of the length, I use some weird angles because they are more convenient from an analytical point of view. We can get tether tension versus time. We can get angle of attack and set the sleep angle. Pitch, roll, and jaw. Velocities. And trajectory of the kite. Height versus lateral displacement and height versus longitudinal displacement. And versus time. We also have, and maybe you can show the, the flight gen. Our simulator can also tackle a, a drone with rotors. And we incorporate the rotation of the rotors self consistently in the model. Because you know that each time you have something rotating, you have the same gyroscopic effect. And if you notice it, turn, something that is uh, spinning very fast. So the simulator takes into account such, uh, this type of effect. Yeah, so this is simulation. We are started with the with the drone. Maybe Antonio, you can click here. Uh, so here you have a, a zoom. Here you, got, you have a side view of the simulator with the rotors. I think you, yeah, this is a side view. It, it has two rotors. And for this simulation, what we study, we were interested in the stability. So what's happened before doing 
a cycle, we want to see what happens if we try to keep the, the, the kite at a fixed point. And we want to see what are the game modes of, 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 the, of, the, of the system. So we took the kite, we put it at the equilibrium, and we perturbed it a little. And what you can see in the simulation, you can click here. In this case, we use different bars to display the tester. Uh, the equilibrium was not stable. It was unstable, and the kite moved to the left. Yeah, they made here some simple picture. Very nice. So, you have questions? Have you introduced some in between the rods? Yes. You say to split the tether and set the rods? Yes. You can introduce some, I, I have no idea, but mm -hmm. some springs to simulate the longitudinal waves or something like that? But they want to avoid such a wave. Uh, some people also work it with, they took the, the tether, instead of substituting the tether by several lead bars, they put masses connected with the springs and dampers. But if you put the real values of the stiffness of, uh, of a tether for the springs, then the problem is stiff. So what many people do is to put false values for the stiffness. They, they typically introduce a tether that is much more elastic than what it really is. In this simulator, the connection is ideal, in the sense that when a bar rotates with respect to the other one, there is no dissipation. So, Guillermo, what, you, what I want you to do in your project is to make a, a path planning. So first, we want to develop a tool that will create desired trajectories, the path we want to follow. And then we have to design the controller that determines how do we need to modify the length of this braider to make the kite follow the desired path. Now at this moment, uh, the code is open loop, in the sense that you have to read in advance the control load. But what we would like to do is to define a trajectory and the code should compute by itself the control load to follow the path. And this is, as you will see, very challenging. Okay. <laughs> because this is not the type of uh, example you can find in the, in the control books. With one degree of freedom, the simple PID. <coughs> no, here, the system has 20, 30 degrees of freedom. The, the order of this set of equation is 20 or 30. So it is not clear what are the variables you have to touch and, and how. More questions? <coughs> Final comment or remark about the course? I have a question about the mm -hmm. When you said that uh, people are working with tether um, trading mm -hmm. to put some other aerodynamic device uh, to cover the cable, it's have to be stiff in order to follow the elasticity of the. I mean, the game will have waves, so you have to put that much in the other hands. Yeah, that's challenging because, um, let me take the... There are different ways, because uh, today, cable theory is only used in, uh, mainly for the gas, so you have these uh, autonomous submarines with a pedal that provides uh, electricity, whatever pressure for the actuators on board. Eh? And these tethers have this fairing. Uh, there are different kind of fairings. So you can have even uh, wires. If you put some fabric wires, imagine the same uh, cotton wires, so it is stripe of uh, a shirt. When you put wires around the tether, that reduces a lot. In those Reynolds, Reynolds numbers, the drive of the tether. The trick here is that you have to make a tether fairing which is which can be handled in real life. If you can make it. But then you have to really without or uh, 
it has to be stable or dynamical. So perhaps you want to add uh, a fin at the end. You want. And there are several concepts out there. Uh, as far as I know, there is uh, there is there hasn't been done yet uh, a real experimental validation of this. This is a very important topic because it can be applied to all everything, all. Let me show you. <laughs> Let me show you the same simulation I, I showed you, but instead of using one bar, four bars. I forgot to do it before. So it is the same figure of eight, exactly the same type, the same Tefe properties, everything the same, except that instead of using one bar to model the, the Tefe, I use four. And you will see what, what happened. It takes a bit longer because when you add a new bar, uh, the system becomes. Right? It's when I make the, the figure of eight. You see that the kite uh, touch the ground. And this is more clear in the next picture. But the system has exactly the same, the tether has the same, the same weight and the same aerodynamic force. And the same the, control inputs. And the same control input. The only difference is that I use more tether, so now the tether can, can fold. You're capturing another dynamics. And, and capture the tether folding. And it crashes. So you can see that um, the model should be simple, but if you do it too much, too simple, you are losing uh, the physics. Okay? And test of flexibility, not elasticity, but flexibility is key. Because you can see it in the experiment, the tester always makes some kind of parabolic shape. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like how they, like, what is the shape under the aerodynamic loads? Uh -huh. But I this is a stationary condition. Yeah, stationary. Stationary condition. Yeah, yeah. And this, this is it's a consistent simulation taking the contact acceleration of the tether and the inertia. And also the fact that the tether tension changes. So it is necessary to have different <coughs> degrees of complexity. And when you move from linear design to uh, prototype and final testing, you should be able to have different tools to iterate. Let's see how it crashes. Más preguntas? Comentarios finales sobre el curso. Bueno, espero que os haya gustado. Que os sea útil el curso y el crédito. Las dos cosas. Está certificado entonces. Eh, como vais a mandar los trabajos el viernes, pues bueno, lo hacemos a la vuelta de Navidad. El trabajo sí. Certificado, si os parece, cuando vamos de vacaciones, os paséis por mi despacho, os lo imprimo y